Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. This is Jason, host of Fighting Words Financial. Uh, let me know if you folks are out there and you're able to hear. Um, not sure if my microphone is working today. I think it is. But anyway, uh, just let me know in the comments if everything is working technically. And uh, love to hear from you guys. Go ahead and fire away with questions. Today, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, stagflation and the environment that we're in right now. I'm beginning to hear people say the word stagflation more and more. Uh, I think it's probably a little bit early to call that, although kind of the definition of stagflation is inflation as we're going into a uh, recession. Uh, there are there is a more academic explanation for that, but there are rumblings of that uh, starting to occur right now. So one of the things folks are worried about is kind of a repeat of the 1970s. And uh, historians always avoid saying that this is just like something that happened in the past. However, they're all, there are always similarities and always differences between what happened in the past and what's happening in the present. So if you aren't aware of kind of what happened with stagflation, it really kind of picked up in 1973. Yeah, you maybe even started said it started in 1968, um, but in 1973 with the oil embargo, it picked up and gained steam throughout the 1970s and really didn't end until 1982 when Paul Volcker engineered a recession by jacking up short-term interest rates to close to 20%. Okay, so uh, that was the response back then. We didn't use as many wage and price controls as what had been used in the past, but the real question is in that period from 1973 to 1982, what might you have done to make money in the stock market in that time period and what kinds of things can be repeated today and what may or may not be likely to produce the same results so we can talk about some of the big things here um which with stagflation commonly referred to as recession inflation and uh so let's talk about that uh, i'm looking at a lot of folks accounts right now and people are kind of sending me stories about their uh portfolios and the overriding theme that I see in these portfolios is a lack of diversification, uh, a heavy amount of, uh, of in, in investment in technology. I tend to talk a lot about technology on my channel, although I've stated over and over and over that I have a, a, a well-diversified portfolio and about 70% of that is a well-diversified, boring traditional portfolio and roughly 30% is sort of swing for the fences uh, type stocks, right? So. Um, as we go through you know a slowing economy right now not necessarily as sluggish as it was in the 1970s and one of the other characteristics that we haven't seen yet with stagflation is high unemployment rates so those uh unemployment rates are still historically low around the 3.8 to 3.6 uh percentage uh in that area that is just about at full employment. You cannot get 100% of the people who are eligible to work to work in this country, uh, in any country, basically. That's just not how it works. So uh, the 1960s really was when the first time that stagflation popped up and there was a UK politician who kind of like coined it. But in the US, it was about um, right in the 1970s. So throughout history, rising inflation and high unemployment has negatively impacted economic growth in all the major markets on the planet. And this has gone on to affect investors. And during a time of stagflation, people are generally going to be earning less uh, and, and they're going to be spending more on products and services that are rising due to inflation being high. So We've already seen products start to rise. We're also starting to see uh, services start to rise. Although there are some very good signs on the horizon today. Uh, I don't know if you guys were, were paying attention to this article that came out um, you know, on Yahoo News. And uh, let me share that article with you here real quickly. And uh, th this is a bad sign for the economy, but a good sign for markets. And what you really have to decide is what, what is it that is most important to you in terms of markets or, or the economy, um, or, or, sorry, or, or inflation rather. And I, I think that at this point, we have to start thinking about inflation as being more important than preserving our perfect uh, you know, rate of un unemployment here. And uh, yeah, so let's take a look at this article. Let me share my screen. And, and this is very important because this is a leading indicator when it comes to the economy. I've stated for the last couple of weeks now that we are not seeing an end of the world type recession, nothing like the Great Recession of 2008 or the Great Depression of, uh, of 1933. But we are going to see a normalized end of a credit cycle where we see a contraction in, in, uh, in credit being issued due to high interest rates and, of course, tightening lending requirements. 
we see a slowdown in the economy for a number of quarters before it picks back up. Does it mean that the the stock market is not going to pick up long before the actual economy does? Because that's typically what happens in a recession is that the bear market is over and a new bull market begins you know, several quarters before the economy actually picks up steam. So this is what is really important, though, economy-wise, and it's a very important leading indicator. Metals haven't crashed this hard since the Great Recession. So uh, industrial metals are on track for the worst quarter since the 2008 financial crisis and are pummeled by recession worries. Copper, the great economic bellwether, has ricocheted into bear market from a record four months ago, while tin has tumbled 21% in its worst week since the 1980s. And the crisis froze London trading, uh, you know, since the 1980s crisis froze London trading for four years. So uh, like this article says, it's a dramatic reversal from the past two years where metal surged on a weave of post-lockdown optimism and inflationary predictions and supply snarls. Now inflation is here and supplies are still tight, but prices are plummeting as worries about a slowdown in industrial activity across major economies dovetail with slumping demand in China. So for metals like copper, it has uses in everything uh, in heavy industry from machinery to advanced electronics. Um <clears throat> Sorry, guys. <clears throat> Still have a little bit of a cough here. And uh, the mood in metals is soured even as Chinese uh, COVID-19 lockdowns start to ease. And there are signs that trader traders are betting on copper prices falling further. Uh, yeah. So all in all, in terms of inflation, this is a good sign. In terms of uh, the in terms of the actual economy, it's not necessarily a great sign. So uh, happy to talk about what we may want to consider when we're looking at, uh, at at diversifying our investments. But Anthony Walker here uh, makes a good point. Tech is in just about every stock. That is true, but not every stock is a tech stock. Um, and he says that banks are tech stocks now. To a degree, that is absolutely true. Uh, but remember, the credit spreads are the way that banks make money. And they're getting a greater and greater opportunity at this point to make money through credit spreads and through origination of, uh, and through deposits, which they've not really had the opportunity to do for more than you know, 12, 13 years at this point. They've made all of their money on origination fees and, uh, and, and other types of, uh, of banking activities. That's going to change. We're adding a layer and a slice back into how banks are going to make money. And uh, traditional banks aren't necessarily a terrible place to have your invest investment dollars in at this point. But really, uh, you know, the stocks we think about buying during a stagflation period are really kind of your more boring stocks, right? These are stocks that are going to be characterized by really strong current cash flows and have often outperformed high inflation environments in the past. Now, you'd really have to go back pretty far to look to a, high, a sustained high inflation environment. We don't really have a ton of good examples. So unlike being fresh, you know, unlike being freshly out of the 1970s and 1980s, we have to do a little bit more homework here in terms of what we're looking at. So in the past, energy and gold would have been really great inflation hedges, uh, would have been really great hedges for a stagflation type environment However, both of those uh, industries have a bit of a challenge right now. We don't really know what's going to happen with energy in the next 10 to 20 years or so as we see a rotation into uh, sustainable energy generation and, of course, energy storage like battery solutions, uh, you know, gravity storage, that sort of thing. So I still think that there is an opportunity and energy there, but I think you're going to have to be a bit more choosy. I would start looking at pipelines. Uh, things that things that make money by moving energy around, not necessarily things that that you know make money by selling it. Um, yeah, because I do think we're going to see some demand destruction, especially going into the July Fourth weekend, where I predict gas prices are going to break seven dollars a gallon here in Southern California and probably six dollars a gallon in the rest of the country. Um, but yeah, so things like uh, N NRG Energy, uh, AbV, Pulte Group. These are some of the lesser known value stocks that are out there. And this is one of the things I want to talk about. And I was reading this My Wall Street um, article today. Um, value is about to make a really strong, if we, if we really are going through a stagflation type environment, value is about to make a really big comeback. Now, I've talked about the history of markets a lot because I'm kind of, uh, you know, kind of an economic nerd here. 
But one of the main points that I've made a couple of times on live streams and in videos is that between 1966 and 1982, the Dow Jones Industrials hit a thousand in 1966 and they hit a thousand in 1982. The market was basically flat for like a 16 year period. And markets actually spend a lot of time in flat periods. We have really long flat periods when, you, when you're looking at it over a long enough time scale that are often in the 10 to 15 year range. Uh, and, and you, like I said, you have to look at this in a long time scale. Uh, a couple of things that do well in those time periods have, have been in the past gold, energy, and real estate. Okay. And of course, financials as well, but mainly the th overriding theme in those investment periods is value. You're looking at companies with really strong current cash flows that have the likelihood to grow in the future and are, are building on their business. And you're really kind of taking the focus off of growth stocks in that time period because you just have increased risks. Financing your growth has become a lot more expensive for these companies and their pathway to success narrows, meaning a lot of companies are not going to be able to navigate the new environment of tightened credit. And some of them are going to fail to grow to expectations. It doesn't mean that the companies are going to fail in a lot of cases. It simply means that they're going to fail to grow to expectations. So, um, we see here. Let's uh, take a, qu a question here. Uh, inflation is still increasing in Ireland, and that is now leading to increased wage demands. I was on vacation last week, and normally buzzing areas like a ghost town paid two euros eighteen for a liter of diesel. That is pretty close to nine dollars a gallon for diesel in Ireland. Um, yeah, that that's really unfortunate, and that is one of the main things that we saw in. Um, in the 1970s was wage inflation. It wasn't quite keeping up with um, with with, uh, with inflation, of course, like wages. Your wages weren't going up quite as much as inflation. But in a lot of cases, over time, while it hurt in the immediate term, over time, that was enormously beneficial for people who had things like uh, like low debt loads and fixed housing expenses, meaning they had like a fixed loan on their primary home or something like that. Um, so as your expenses for your staples are going up in terms of real dollars, some of your other expenses are lowering. Like my, for example, my mortgage on my home is less than the cost to rent a two bedroom apartment in, in my market at this point. I don't see rents going down in any time period. So the idea of inflation is figuring out how to navigate it and figuring out how to invest. And uh, I am starting to think that I'm going to make a long-term shift in my, uh, you know, my 70% of my portfolio that's invested, you know, in diversified portfolios, I'm going to take a slightly more heavy focus on value stocks going forward. Meaning I'm looking at companies with strong current cash flows that are potentially trading below what they're actually worth. Right. And, uh, I can, in future live streams or future videos, we can talk about how you should value a company. There isn't one way to value a company. There's multiple ways to value a company when you're looking at current cash flows and looking at future cash flows. But I would start to be a little bit more skeptical about future cash flows uh, for a lot of our growth companies. Um, so uh, some of the things that are kind of unfairly beat up right now are fintechs. They've declined across the board since November. A lot of them actually are a lot of them, not just SoFi that I talk about a lot. They, a lot of them are solid growth stories. A lot of them have solid revenues. Uh, and unlike SoFi, uh, companies like Upstart have been uh, profitable for years. <coughs> um, so those are the things you want to take a look at. Your consumer discretionary stocks, your technology stocks, um, those are the ones going to suffer the most. And uh, yeah, so we should be taking a look at those uh, here in the future. So uh, any other questions you guys have, feel free to answer. Did want to mention, of course, that the Super Chat features are on. And if you want to have a discussion about the causes of inflation, I would feel like that I'm kind of repeating myself over and over and over because we do talk about that. But the bottom line is it is supply shock. Supply shock lasts for a long time. It's been sort of the leading cause, not the only cause of a lot of inflationary periods going back all the way to World War II. I'm talking about 1946 to 48. 1949 and 50, 1953, 1968 to, to, to 70, and then again from 73 on to 1982. A lot of that had to do with supply shock. One of the investments that may not do so well this time around in a high inflationary environment is gold. Now, I know that the 
conventional wisdom, or at least what you hear all the time, is that gold is tied to inflation. That isn't necessarily true when you actually look at inflation rates versus gold prices over time. Yes, in gold prices do go up during certain inflationary periods, and in other inflationary periods, they really don't. And sometimes it goes up when we have no inflation, which happened a lot between 2005 and, say, 2013, where we had very little inflation and we had uh, gold prices go through the roof. Maybe I got those dates wrong, but it was in that early 2000s uh, time period. So one of the reasons that gold increased so greatly from 1973 to 1982 is because we were sort of coming off the last vestiges of the gold standard there and uh market in the united states was at least uh, other countries had already come off of it and uh we the markets really weren't uh weren't able to react to that news in a rational manner in a lot of cases uh but there's no guarantee that that is going to happen here in the future um YB says, what do you think about STPK? That is not a stock that I've looked into um, very much. Um, let me see if I can pull something up here. STPK. Um, whoops. Am I looking at that correctly? STPK. So I am not pulling that up through Coifin. Is it not traded on U.S. markets here? So... Um, I don't know. So, but let's take a look at markets today. The, the uh, market reaction today to very little news in markets was actually relatively sedate. After being up 6% last week, Dow Jones is down 109 points, about 0.3%. The NASDAQ is down 87 points or about 0.7%. Uh, S&P down 5.98%, roughly 0.2%. And Russell 2000 was up 175 and change um, roughly 0.63 percent. This is basically a, um, a this is basically a flat day. So Stephen Kua says, "What do you think about Polestar stock PSNY?" Man, that's a, that's a complex question. Um, so Polestar, unlike a lot of these other companies, <coughs> ha has major backing from uh, from from you know, from a major conglomerate in China. They've got all the money they need in the world. They are um, producing vehicles at this point. They have factories. They have a labor force in place. Um, I would say that as far as comparing them to some of the other startups that I've talked about in the past two years, they are definitely right off the bat in a better position. Um, I also think that it's going to be very hard to predict where the market goes. Tesla not only has competitors now, um, but they, they have competitors selling vehicles inside the United States, outside of the United States, uh, and they are still not able to keep up with demand for their vehicles at this point. I think there's a lot of room for Polestar to enter as long as they're able to produce uh, in volume and support at least a modicum of demand to start building br you know, brand recognition here. Um, I, I want to say that, the, that Polestar is actually roundabout way. It's owned by Geely. I don't remember. I know that they bought um, uh, bought Vo they bought Volvo and a couple of other brands in Europe, and Polestar is a spinoff of one of those. So um, they and Geely is not a fly by night company. This is a company worth you know tens of billions of dollars in market cap. They produce about 1.7 million vehicles a year in China, and they own a couple of brands out you know, formerly European brands outside of the United States. So, and they got them for dirt cheap for like one to three billion dollars in a couple of cases. So sort of rebranding Polestar, uh, marketing as an electric vehicle, I think they have a better chance for success than something like a canoe did or something like electric, you know, like Lion Electric or um, uh, you know, even Rivian in some cases. Like I do think they have a, a pretty good chance of success there. So, uh, yeah. So let's talk about uh, STEM here. Whoops. Pull up. Let's take a look here at STEM. And let's take a look at price and volume here for just a moment for STEM. And then, hold on just a second. Let me pull up some other information real quick. All right. Um, 
for some reason, my quote generator is not working again. All right. So, um, all right. So not a ton of news on STEM that's out there at this point. Um, negative earnings, of course, of, uh, you know, negative point, you know, 31 cents per share. One year price targets are roughly 17.83. Um, this is a one year price target. I don't tend to pay a ton of attention attention to one year price targets here. We're looking at, of course, everything involved in uh, the markets being down, of course, over the last six months or so. Um, but the funny thing is, is, man, for this company, I hear a lot of people talk about it. I don't see a lot of actual news uh, about this company at all that, that uh, in terms of press releases or anything. In terms of uh, recommendations, we have and just in May, we have two strong buys, uh, three buys, and one hold. We don't have any sells or underperforms at this at this time period. So analysts seem to like this stock, even though it has declined precipitously over the last couple of months. Um, but it's never been profitable, at least since 2018. It does have really strongly growing revenues, but this is a really small company, right? They've gone in four years from just over a million dollars in revenue, building up to $140 million in revenue. That's a, that's a quickly growing company, but it's still pretty strong. Um, and they operate, of course, in digitally connected energy storage. Um, they, they provide products here in the United States. They offer energy storage systems uh, from, you know, from original um, equipment manufacturers. And um, so I've, I, I've done a little bit of investing or in investigating into this company. I don't own any of the stock. Uh, I don't really have a clear grasp on how their art, their energy, their artificially intelligent energy management system is better than any of the competitors that are out there at this point, and whether or not they're really going to be able to compete with someone like a Tesla going forward. So, uh, if we look going all the way back to August 2021, it's been a steady decline. I'm not saying anything negative about the stock in this case. That is a, a, really since November, everything uh, clean energy related has been in decline as expectations have sort of come back to uh, ground here. So investing in the energy sector, though, has typically been one of the ways to keep up with stagflation as their, uh, you know, as inflation rises, their rates rise. Uh, typically for more mature energy companies, their dividends rise as well. It'd be a very, very long time before we saw a dividend from STEM, of course. Uh, you know, you, you, Typically, those companies have revenues in the billions of dollars a year uh, at that point. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so STEM is a company that, that you may want to keep an eye on. Do I want to jump in with both feet at this point? I'm not sure. Um, I did take one, you know, really speculative risk here recently, and that was with uh, Big Bear AI. It's an AI. It, it's an AI company that's that has offices, I think, in Minnesota, California, Washington D.C. They're primarily a government contractor, but in terms of other big speculative risks right now, um, that one hasn't been on my list. Not to say it won't be one, uh, on the future. So, uh, let me see here. Is there any hope for uh, uh, XLS stock, XLS technology? What do you think about their, or what do you know about their business model? Mark, honestly, I don't know that much about their business model. I uh, I have, they, there's the, I get a lot of requests for people to take a look at businesses and I just can't keep up with all the requests at this point. Um, but let me take a quick look here. Really? take a quick look here at uh at what i can find and uh as you guys remember my internet connection whatever my um uh, my i'm doing a live stream on is pretty slow but um let's take a look here at, at um la resources and let's take a look at revenue and growth here <clears throat> revenue and growth in this case i did look at the stock very briefly the other day um yeah let me see here. Graph is not available in this case for revenue and growth. So maybe I don't know if this is an error with the website or they haven't published much recently. Let me take a look at my other uh, information source here. So uh, market cap of only 625 million. Uh, they haven't had any earnings releases recently. Volume is fairly low right now. Average volume is about, this is a kind of a worrying sign. So if average volume is roughly 716,000, like average shares trading daily, and now it's at 101,000, uh, that, that's usually a pretty bad sign. Um, let me see here. 
Oh, so exploration stage in uh, mineral properties, focusing on gold, silver, iron, rare earth minerals, and other exploitable resources. So I, I think a lot of people misunderstand the way some of these ex like these oil exploration companies, some of them, some of the oil exploration companies and some of the mineral exploration companies are set up. They are set up as sort of like separately taxable silos of usually a subsidiary of a much larger company to protect them from the event of failure. And failure happens quite a bit when it comes with exploration companies. You know, they get a lease somewhere, they drill, they dig, they don't find what they're expecting to find. And the whole company blows up and goes into bankruptcy. Uh, they, uh, companies are kind of set up this way to protect the investors. They're either set up as limited partnerships or as S corps or C corps in order to limit the liability of the investors that are in there. So a, a lot of times when you're seeing a company fail like this, it's a pop-up company in a lot of ways. If, if it's successful, it's successful. A lot of times the, the parent company will buy out uh, the subsidiary or they'll sell it to someone else. But in this case, I don't know a ton about the business model. I do know that investing in um, in exploration companies like that is extremely risky. And a lot of times it's just better for you to buy the larger companies that are probably going to buy them out anyway, uh, in a lot of cases. So, uh, But in, in terms of how you would handle stagflation, I think that there's a lot of companies in that mineral space that are going to do really well. Uh, Albemarle is one of those. You should go and take a look at the holdings of um, an ETF called LIT and another one called BATT. And those companies are going to have a lot of those uh, ETFs going to have a lot of companies inside of there that, that mine things that are used in creating uh, energy storage products, which I think regardless of what happens with inflation, we're looking at energy storage products becoming a much larger part of our economy and our lives. And I'm not talking just about uh, electric vehicles. I'm really talking about grid level uh, storage technologies. It's not all going to be lithium. It's not all going to be vanadium flow batteries or sodium batteries. Some of it's going to be really creative uh, gravity storage and that sort of thing. I think uh, you know Shoeless Joe made that uh, made that point on the last live stream. So uh, Frantic Pillow says, "What's up, man?" I'm saying, "What's up? How you doing, buddy?" Uh, frequent uh, person on my live streams, and uh, yeah, um, you know, so happy to hear from any of you guys in terms of questions when it comes to. A lot of uh, um, like obscure individual stocks. I'm really kind of flying by the seat of my pants here and just reading as I go along. I haven't researched a lot of them. So um, Keith X says, I've been buy buying a lot of SoFi just to average down and sell them. It reaches back to my average. Uh, any downside of this method? I don't have to pay any taxes because they sold them at cost. Um, so not necessarily, a, not necessarily a downside to that method, although all averaging averaging your cost down, but it's really kind of a form of, of mental accounting in a way. Um, are you really ahead there? So I, I still, I, I tend, I'm trying not to talk about SoFi every day, just because I talk about it so much, uh, just because I, I know the company so well, uh, but I am limiting myself on how much I'm buying just because um the uh just because it's become so much a part of my portfolio such a huge part of my overall net worth that i really need to limit that to to limit my risk right um but i i am looking at them as a super long-term investment 10 20 years i'm looking at a 10x return in that time period um, and, and i think that's not just 10x from six dollars a share right now i think that's 10x from 15 dollars a share so in 10 years, I expect that price to be somewhere around $150 a share. So uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, ben Green Sky coming says, what about Hood today? Greetings from Germany. So word on the street is that another uh, large company out there is looking to acquire Robin Hood. I think a lot of that has to do with how low the price of their stock is right now. And a lot of that has to do with how much they control. Because they, they do a lot of business with other fintechs as well. And um, they have a really loyal uh, fan base in terms of their users. And so I do think they're, they, they are definitely in acquisition target right now, uh, friendly or hostile. They might be an acquisition target at this point. So uh, I would expect, I, I mean, I wouldn't expect, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a tender offer in the future and, uh, and you know, relatively closely in the near future. So uh, I'm actually really I'm actually really curious to see what happens with that. I looked at uh, investing in Robinhood 
it was maybe it was last year and I never ended up doing it for a variety of reasons. I, I may or may not invest in a stock. Sometimes if I don't totally understand the business model, I won't invest in it. Sometimes if I just don't see if they're special, I won't invest in it. Uh, and sometimes I'm just happier owning it through an ETF because I don't think it's special enough to invest it. So, um, so, hey, Jason, happy Tuesday here in Australia. What is your gut feeling on residential solar take up in the U.S.? I'm an Enphase stockholder and so keen for insights. So Enphase is uh, the invest one of those investments that I didn't understand why it went so crazy. The uh, solar technology is not new. And a lot of the stuff involved in solar technology today, including the um, the converter units, including the monitoring units and all the smart units out there, that, those really aren't that new either. But uh, solar uptake is probably going to just increase and increase and increase in the United States. There's a lot of resistance to doing solar outside of the Southwest. A lot of that really has to do um, uh, with politics in, in, in a lot of ways. There's a, there's a lot of rumors and misinformation when it comes to having solar. So I've had solar on my house now for eight years. I haven't had an electric bill for eight years. My system at this point has more than paid for itself. I've had zero problems and very little decline in um, in 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 uh, in and power output. I originally bought about 130 percent of my power needs. I'm pretty much right at the maximum right now. So if I add a vehicle, I'm going to need to add panels to it. Like if I add an electric vehicle, I need to add panels to it. But um, the vast majority of the cost to putting your solar on your house these days is not the solar panels. It's not the converter or the inverter, rather. It's basically labor. It's getting people on your roof to put it up there. So financial innovations, meaning uh, I mean, financing options and leasing options, have made it really easy for folks in the Southwest to put solar on their house. So I think it's already something like 26% of homes in California have solar power. Um, and all new development has to have solar. I don't know what the exact requirements are. I don't know if it's enough solar to power their house completely. Um, I know it doesn't require that you have like battery backup systems or anything like that. Um, so when it comes to household battery backup systems, like um, the Tesla Powerwall, I, I honestly am not sure how much that's going to to last. Uh, I, I actually see larger neighborhood size battery backup plans are probably going to be the wave of the future. There's already a lot of test projects going on in your country, on Australia. Um, there's really large projects in California, in Florida, in Texas. There are some really large uh, like neighborhood size energy storage, uh, you know, solar energy storage projects that are going, going on right now. These are kind of being done on a speculative basis, on like a test market basis and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Ben Green Sky coming from Germany says market or uh, Robinhood has a market cap of seven billion US dollar uh, and uh, six billion in cash. Yeah. Like I said, <coughs> they're a prime takeover target at this point. And they have a fairly large and loyal fan base. So, yeah, um, this is an interesting question here. Um, what do you think about PayPal right now? And what is uh, is it something you're holding? Yes, PayPal is something that I hold as an individual stock. I only hold 100 shares. Uh, I have been, I am, I am going to acquire more. That that's a, as it's down now in the next couple of months. I think we have a real opportunity between June and August to uh, pick up a lot of stocks at a discount. I think PayPal is one of those. Um, and I, I think that they just have a solid business model. They have a lot of ways to make revenue. They're an innovative company with an innovative culture. And uh, I think they're going to do just, just fine. Square is one of those as well. I think they're being punished right now for their, uh, their concentration on crypto. And to a degree, right, rightly so. Their, their sort of announcement and pivot to that was done at the height of the market. So I kind of understand what's going on. So I own Square stock as well. Uh, my my average cost on that is some, somewhere around $100 a share. So I've gotten punished on that as well. Uh, but at least I didn't buy it at like $250 a share, right? But PayPal certainly looks very interesting, but it's going to be a longer term investment. Like I don't, if I bought it at, you know, if I bought PayPal today, like I don't expect to make real money or to double my return anytime in the next two to three years. I think it's going to take a while to come back to its sort of, um, you know, 250 level highs. I think it's going to be a couple of years before that happens. So um, in, in terms of other markets 
outside of the United States as well. And I've made this point many times. Uh, in, inflation is not a political issue. It's a global issue at this point. Virtually every country is focused, is, um, is uh, having inflation issues at this point. One of the major strategies for dealing with stagflation and inflation in the past was to hold a lot of your funds in, in or hold a lot of your portfolio in international funds. And when I say a lot, what I really mean is about 10%, right? About 10% of your portfolio in international funds. International funds to a large degree kind of fell out of favor after 2008. Emerging markets really got crushed. Uh, the BRICs, like Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, China is the only market that really came roaring back in that case. So the sort of uh, rotation that we're going to be seeing here in the future is more of a focus on consumer staples, focus on energy, possibly focus on gold, which I think might long term kind of be a mistake, uh, income producing real estate. Uh, and, and materials to a degree. I think consumer discretionary things are out for a while. Technology, even communications to a degree, it's been so commoditized. Um, you may want to start sticking that into that uh, consumer staples thing. Uh, but yeah, a lot of issues. Healthcare, healthcare is one of those sectors, guys, that it's far better off to hold that in an ETF. Don't try to guess, man. Uh, there's so much going on with healthcare in terms of Potential regulation coming down the road, potential deregulation coming down the road, new discovery, new discoveries in science, disruption from healthcare technologies. I think it's far better to take a uh, diversified approach when it comes to healthcare. Even like I I'm fascinated with genomics technologies. I make zero attempt whatsoever to actually purchase individual genomic stocks. I do everything through uh, through ETFs at this point, and largely because as much as I know about genomics and as fascinated as I am with it. I actually don't know enough to understand whether or not a certain approach or a certain technology is actually going to be, you know, make that company successful. Um, you know, I, I think one of the best ways, and I know, and I talk about this company a lot. I think one of the best ways to hedge kind of all bets in this case is a company like Nvidia. Um, they're involved at pretty much every sector of the technology world at this point. I'm talking about healthcare. I'm talking about communications gaming, uh, you know, industrial modeling, genomics, all of that stuff. And, and gaming you're going to see is, is going to become, it's still going to, they're still going to see strong growth in gaming, but you're going to see it become a declining portion of the revenue pie moving forward as all of these other sectors grow. So yeah, uh, no, just wanted to talk about a few ways today about how we could start to think about investing in a stagflationary environment. And really it's that rotation to value rotation to consumer staples and income producing real estate that I think is going to help you guys um, move through that. I'm not even necessarily talking about going out and buying a, uh, you know, an, an income property for yourself. You will find out if you do enough of the research that when you look at total return of uh, REITs, real estate investment trusts if in your local market, you will find out in a lot of cases that it doesn't outperform or that it does outperform real estate over time. A lot of that has to do with they're able to leverage economies of scale as a landlord and you are not. They're able to get all of their goods and services at lower prices. Um, and you know, you're you may think that that three percent dividend on a real estate investment trust is, is not worth it because you're getting six or seven percent, you know, uh, cap, uh, uh, you know, a cap rate on owning a rental property yourself. But when you start to look at the combination of capital gains combination of dividend payout or you know, distribution payout for the real estate investment trust, as well as the lack of actual management you have to do, the fact that you spend zero time on it, you'll probably find out that it's either outperforming properties that you own or could own, or it's underperforming them by one or 2%. And in my case, having a, um, yeah, having a, uh, a, investment in properties where I don't have to worry about tenants. I'm not going to have to go to court, which you do have to go to court occasionally when you own rental property. And if you own enough rental properties, it's not going to be occasionally. Uh, you don't get paid for going to court. And a lot of times things are settled out of court and you both walk away unhappy. Owning a real estate investment trust in uh, this high inflationary environment might be a really good idea. And that's something I'd start taking a look at. I tend to own a uh, residential real estate investment trusts. And uh, I've been avoiding for a decade now, I've been avoiding um, anything involved in retail. 
and especially anything involved in like office buildings. I think that those I still own uh, realty income, which used to have a focus on office buildings. I've really switched to retail, but like really large uh, market single tenant retail. Like we're talking buildings that like Home Depot is in or Lowe's is in or something like that. Um, that that's the only sort of commercially focused real estate investment trust that I own anymore. Everything else is apartment REITs or or, or something like that. Um, and uh, long-term care facilities is another thing. Um, there's a, there are a couple of long-term care facility REITs out there. They really got punished during the pandemic. Um, and I ended up buying a small amount of some of those. I wish I had bought more. Uh, but I do think that as more and more baby boomers start retiring, more and more of them are going to be going into long-term care. That is a different angle on residential real estate. Dividends tend to be fairly high on those and, and, and uh, the capital gains on those tend to be uh, quite a bit lower. So, so the distribution that you get every quarter or every month tends to be a little bit higher than residential real estate, you know, in the four to 5% range rather than the three, you know, the two to 4% range. Uh, so it's in the four to 5% range, but generally you don't have as much capital appreciation. But if you're looking for income or a way to sort of soften the blow of rising prices, that may be one of the things that you want to check out. So uh, this is not a recommendation, but LTC is uh, the ticker symbol for one of those companies. Actually, I don't even know if they're still in business. It's been two years since I've looked at them. But there are a number of others out there uh, that focus on long-term care. You can just Google long-term care, R-E-I-T, long-term care REIT, and you should be able to find all the information you need on that. That is a sector you may want to seriously consider, though. Um, yeah. So uh, any other questions you guys might have, I do need to cut this one a bit short today. I've only got about 50 minutes. So I got about 10 minutes left. Um, you can ask your craziest questions about finance. I'm happy to answer them or just tell you, I don't know. So, um, which I, I, when you guys bring up some of these like smaller obscure stocks, like, like I said, a lot of times I just say, I don't really know that much about them, but let's take a look at what's available online right now, which means I'm taking a very shallow look at those stocks guys. Um, you could do deeper research on that and find out things that I don't know. And I'm not going to catch in the 30 seconds to five minutes that I take looking at uh, some numbers here. I'm also extremely numbers focused, right? I tend not to pay as much attention to the credentials or personalities behind a business. I like numbers, right? And that's just a personal bias of mine. A friend of mine once told me uh, after my wife cut my hair and I didn't notice for like four days, he told me that if your wife's hair was made of numbers, you would have noticed right away. That is true. That is true. I wanted to say it wasn't true, but it was absolutely true. Um, so yeah, all kinds of things. Then it comes all kinds of qualitative things when it comes to a company that I could completely uh, you know underestimate. I have consistently underestimated the uh, qual the qualitative qualities. Know, that's a really bad way of saying that. I've consistently underestimated some of the qualities of a company like Apple that has caused me to miss out on a lot of their growth, right? So that's a big sort of blind spot on my part as an investor. Um, so a couple of crazy things about markets today. Stock markets were basically flat, but we could kind of say that they were down. Um, so fixed income markets were also mostly down across the board. The only thing that was up was convertibles. The convertibles market is going to be very interesting over the next two to four years. And if you don't know what convertible bonds are, um, it's not something that's been a popular, uh, it's not something that's being a popular uh, uh, subject over the last 10 to 15 years, but I think it's about to become a lot more popular as the cost of borrowing money, the cost of bond issues raises. I think on my last live stream, I made the point that in the past week, there had been zero corporate bond issues, zero corporate bond issues in that entire week, which is almost unbelievable. I expect to see that market to normalize a little bit here going forward, but I also expect to see more issues of convertible bonds. So convertible bonds are bonds that at a certain strike price for the stock, you can convert it into shares. You know, say like you own a you know a thousand dollar bond, you can convert it to uh, you know, 40 shares at, at $20, whatever that math is, or at $50 or whatever. Um, so whatever the math is, you can convert it at, at that point. And the advantage for the companies is they can typically issue these for a much lower coupon uh, than, than a regular bond would be issued because it has the ability to be converted into a stock. And if it does get, get converted into a stock, you have a slight dilution 
of um, you know of the of the stock, but you don't owe that money. You don't have to pay back that principal. So that in this rising interest rate environment, I expect two things. Number one, that's probably going to become more frequently issued by companies that are out there. Like Tesla has used this a lot in the past. Um, and uh, I expect to see that to see other companies use this more. Tesla actually issued and Neo too a number of zero coupon convertible bonds, meaning they paid zero interest on the bond. You were only guaranteed to get your principal back. But if the stock price went above the strike, you were able to convert it into shares. They pretty much got free financing in in exchange for a little bit of dilution. And with a company like Tesla, folks really haven't been all that afraid of dilution. Um, and uh, yeah, so when a company's small, you're kind of afraid of dilution. By the time it gets that large, you're you're a little bit less afraid of it. So uh, Martin Cousineau from Canada says, hi, Jason. Nice to see you. What metrics are you looking at to figure out how close we are to the bottom? And are you monitoring margin calls? So I'm monitoring, monitoring margin calls to a degree. Um, but uh, what I've seen a lot of my personal practice and, well, not in my personal practice, but in uh, the, the accounts that I'm taking a look at is uh, that people have sort of preemptively made the, because there's a lot more information about margin calls this time around. There's a lot of newer investors who are terrified of margin calls. And I'm seeing a lot of maneuvering here to reduce margin already. So there's a lot of people are making moves where they're incurring losses in order to reduce margin. We haven't seen the sort of mass margin calls that I expected to have already seen. The market declined by about 20%. I really expected to see you know, more news, more actual metric come, up, come out about market calls. So the... Uh, the metrics that I'm really looking at in this case, where I, I, where I said that the probable top for this market back in January, if this was a normal market, and uh, based on price to earnings ratios, we should have seen the market peak at about 3,600 and maybe decline by about 10% after that. So about 3,600 should be close to the bottom here, somewhere within 10% of that number. And that's really based on reversing the growth rate that we saw with price to earnings versus actual earnings growth. Okay. So typically when a market rises, 70% of that market gain is based on actual earnings growth. And about 30% of that is based on an expansion of multiples, which is the price to earnings ratio. So when we kind of worked backwards and so Morgan Stanley wrote an article on this and I put together a spreadsheet and kind of worked backwards on this. If we reversed the order, meaning that we if we kind of, because typically that's what happens, right? But in this last run up in the market, those multiples were reversed where price to earnings ratios, uh, multiple expansion actually accounted for 70% of market growth and actual earnings growth only accounted for about 30%. So if you reverse those metrics all the way back to the beginning of this last bull market, uh, and I'm, I'm really going to put that last bull market in middle of 2020, not going all the way back to, to 2000, um, 2010 or so, you, you would see that the bottom, of the, the top of the market really should have been about 3,600, right? If the first quarter of negative growth that we saw was you know January to March, 3,600 should have been the peak then, and we should be about... So we were the market was overvalued and PDE ratios got stretched and it got stretched because of the available cash that was out there and the amount of you know uh, investor exuberance that was out there. So um, yeah, that, so price to earnings ratio right now is one of the most important metrics that I'm looking at for looking at value stocks. I am making a little bit of a rotation in my ETF portfolio to uh, value. I'm not doing a ton of that in individual stocks. But I have been thinking about picking up some really boring individual stocks right now, like the Johnson & Johnsons, the 3Ms, uh, the Procter & Gamble's, and that sort of thing. I, I just think that they're going to perform really well over the next couple of years. So, um, But yeah, price-to-earnings ratios right now, they have not been the most important metric for people to value a stock. And let's be honest, a lot of people have had ludicrous valuations of, of, of stocks or expectations of stocks. Uh, based on growth rates that may never uh, materialize. Um, but yeah, price to earnings is one of those uh, most important things right now. So I want to move on to Keith X's question right here. Uh, what is one REIT that you own? Do you own res? I do own res. I do. And um, so Re res has a little bit of an issue. They use a different weighting method than a couple of other REITs that are out there. 
but they are the only REIT that I know of that is a REIT of REITs, meaning it's a REIT that only holds other REITs and it's all residential, right? So uh, yeah, the, okay, yeah. So I'm going to move on to Hal's question here because it's very interesting. Um, the, uh, so that's one of the ones I hold. So there, there was an article that was written about two or three years ago uh, where it pointed out that Res has actually underperformed the index uh, a little bit over time. And it has to do with how it's weighted. And it did cause a little bit of concern. I ultimately didn't sell anything out of my res holdings. I think I hold something like 640 shares of that. So it is a it is a substantial part of a, a, a substantial holding that I have. Um, but I've held it now for, for I want to say, it, it's been a while. It's been at least since, since like 2017. And the only reason I ended up buying that is I kind of just got tired of looking at new uh, REITs. And I was just like, screw it. I already own like four apartment REITs. Uh, I own, already own realty uh, income. Why don't I just buy res instead? So because it's a read of REITs, I'm diversified. It's still in the sector that I want to be. Um, and yeah, so I, I've actually had really good luck with that. I've had uh, a lot of growth out of that too. So. <coughs> <coughs> so Hal makes this really good point. It's actually a really good point. He says, I only buy low beta, high dividend stocks with my margin loan. Not super efficient, but smooths out the bumps in the road. So I never really get close to margin calls. That's actually a super good strategy, right? So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my high risk investments and, and do most of those in cash because I don't want to magnify my losses, right? Um, using, you know, buying low beta, low beta, if you don't know, it means that in, in relation to the market, it's less volatile, meaning it's going to go up a little bit less when the market, you know, shoots to the, shoots to the moon. But it's going to go down a little bit less when the bottom drops out of the market as well. Um, and the main thing you don't want to do is get below that that you know thirty percent or twenty five percent, you know, uh, equity in your margin loan, and you'd be forced to either put more money in or sell that stock to satisfy, satisfy your margin. It can really force you to lock in a loss, and it can really magnify the losses because now you not only is the stock on down, but you still owe the same amount of money that you borrowed. That's actually a really good strategy. One that I approve of one that um, I, I haven't really thought about consciously, but I do that. I always say, you know, what stock do I really want to borrow money to buy? Right? Like if I, I, I would much rather, you know, see, see a narrow range of loss on a stock, right? If I have money borrowed against it, than a really high range of loss. Yeah. You can borrow a hundred thousand dollars and go out and buy Tesla stock with that. And maybe it doubles in the next six months. But it can also stay below your buying cost for a year and a half, like it did with you know my second round, uh, hundred shares of uh, Tesla stock that I bought. I don't remember exactly where I bought it, but it was underwater for eighteen months. Um, and if I had paid, uh, you know, if I'd borrowed a hundred thousand dollars and bought that on margin, I would have really resented that thousand dollars a month or so in uh, margin expenses that I was paying every month. Uh, in the end, it would have worked out, but it's not going to work out with every stock. It just won't. So um, Hal says, I only use cash for high beta and try to convert as many as I can to free carry in a rising market. Um, not, not a terrible strategy at all when it comes to using leverage. Leverage is very dangerous in this market for two reasons. Number one, the number of winners in this market is going to get narrower. And we're going to see, a, we're going to hear a great commode flushing of low quality stocks as they end up crashing down and nev they never get back to their sky high valuations um, just because they never are able to capture or ride that market enthusiasm again. Um, I think that's a solid strategy. The additional problem with having high uh, amount of margin right now is that your margin rates are going to go up and they're going to go up pretty quickly and pretty precipitously. Um, they're already at nine or 10% for most uh, major brokerage houses. I know that they're lower than that for Robinhood, like around 3% or something and for a couple of other companies out there, but that's temporary. Th these are, um, so the, the amount of the, and this is all done by formula folks. When you get a margin call, it's done by a computer, man. It is not done by a person. No one is singling you out personally. It's just that you drop below the minimum amount of equity. You have to put money in. The company is trying to prevent themselves from losing money. They don't actually care if you lose money, right? Uh, and, and that's the thing to understand is the, the people where you trade, if it's a Robin Hood or a Morgan Stanley, 
or uh, a Merrill Lynch or whatever, if you're using their electronic platform, they don't actually care if you make money or lose money. They just want you to trade because that's how they make money, right? And they want you to use margin because they charge a lot of interest on it. And uh, you also trade more. If you use margin, you typically trade more frequently. They make more money on spreads. Just because you're not paying a commission doesn't mean you're not paying. It means they're taking their money either through order routing or they're taking it out through the spread between the bid and the ask, right? They want you to trade as frequently as possible. If you have margin, you're more likely to trade. So I use margin rather sparingly, but I do use it. Uh, like there's no reason not to in a lot of cases, but I, I typically keep my margin at way less than 50% of my account value, uh, my overall account value. And I have it isolated, meaning that I have a margin account and I have several accounts that are like not margin at all. Like my ETF portfolio, um, I don't, I don't use any margin to buy ETFs whatsoever, but for individual stocks, I will definitely do that. It is dangerous to do that in this environment. If you don't have any experience, I would try to keep the overall amount of money that you borrow on margin somewhere less than 50% and less than a quarter if you can manage it. Uh, we're all in for some nasty surprises. So yeah, uh, but that Hal, that's a really good strategy. Um, it, yeah, where, where are you from in Australia, by the way? Uh, I'm just curious to know because I was looking at your photo there of your dog. And it looks like you're on the beach. Um, love to visit Australia. One of these days, uh, it's one of those countries I've never been to, but I would love to do that. Uh, anyway, any other questions about the market guys? Um, I'm going to give this about another four or five minutes or so before I call it a day. <clears throat> I feel kind of a major coughing fit coming on and I do have actual work to do. You know, YouTube is just my hobby. And, uh, yeah. So any questions about the market, about finance, um, I, there, there's a lot going on with the real estate market right now. That is, that is not good. Um, I, I do expect, and I still see YouTube real estate, so-called moguls telling people to borrow money and put everything out there, you know, and, and just and every, that, that real estate never goes down. That of course, not the case. Um, uh, so you live in Tarangal, New South Wales on the East coast. Great place. I don't know where that is. I'm actually going to look that up when I get off of here. Um, don't know anything about that. So um, Carnival Cruise Lines. Oh, man. Um, so the, back when the pandemic started, I knew a lot of people invested in Carnival Cruise Lines and made a quick turnaround and, and some pretty good money on some of that. As a long-term investment, uh, th this is not something that I've ever really liked their payout ratio on their dividends was 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 higher than they could actually sustain. It was always higher than they could sustain. The cruise line industry tends to go through booms and busts. If you time those booms and busts correctly, you could do fairly well. Uh, but yes, you see here. Uh, yeah, so I have a friend that's going all in on cover call ETFs. Is any risk and concerns of that strategy? Actually, right now is probably one of the worst times to go all in on a cover call ETF especially because those cover call ETFs are uh, paying out now more than they're actually uh, generating an income, right? What they actually generate in income has actually no relationship to what they pay in distributions. Also, they're selling at the money calls, meaning that every time the market rises and those shares get called away, they have to buy it back at a uh, at, at greater expense. So as the market rises, which we are close to the, we're either, I think we're pretty close to the bottom, and uh, at this point, those cover call ETFs in when the market rises really quickly is actually going to really hurt those funds in the long run. They're going to have to cut their distributions. And once you start cutting your distributions, that's going to affect the share price. So it, it's not a NASDAQ fund. It's not an S&P 500 fund. It's an at the money covered call strategy. And when the market goes up very quickly, let's say you know, you buy at the money cover calls, they expire at the end of the month. By the time you're able to recycle those funds and get that money back in the market, it, it's up another five or 6%. How do you make that up? You got to cut your dividend in the future or your distribution in the future. So, yeah. So, uh, Vane H says, will this rally last longer or you think the sell-off has begun? Well, the market's been selling off since November. And I made the point that, uh, in my last, um, uh, live stream that there is every possibility that this could already be the beginning of a new bull market. And I know that sounds crazy, but go back and look at the history of the beginnings of other bull markets. It always happens two or three quarters before the economy actually stops contracting, the market gets better. And I made this point and I have this memorized because I, I lived through it. 
March 9th of 2008, the market hits, or 2009 rather, market hits bottom. And it just go takes off like a rocket. By June, it's up by like 40%. By January of next year, it's up 57%. The problem was the economy kept contracting from June of 2009 all the way through January 10th of 2010. Every quarter in, in, that, in that time period, the market was actually contracting. We didn't see positive GDP growth until after January 10th. And yet the market was up 57% in that time period because of the massive sell-off, right? And then the market bounced back. But that was an extreme case. But in every single case, the market actually starts to rise before we see uh, the economy start to, to grow again. So it, there's not even a guarantee that we have a contracting economy this quarter, right? And there's a number of reasons why we may not have a contracting economy in an inflationary environment, especially because essential services have started to rise now, as well as uh, all of your consumer staple costs have started to rise. So on the surface, it may look like the economy is actually growing this quarter. I don't think it is in terms of real dollars when you factor in inflation, but we definitely had a... Um, a, uh, a, a, a contracting economy in the first quarter. I suspect we have one in this quarter. I suspect we'll have one in the next quarter, but the econ the stock market may take off long before that. Uh, yeah. So <coughs> um, Russia uh, bond default is going to affect our markets. Probably not. Uh, so number one, I think Russia only has maybe $280 billion in uh, bonds, uh, foreign owned bonds that could actually default on. Um, I, I think that's the case. It may be a little bit larger than that, but it's not that much larger. They don't have trillions of dollars in debt like we do. Um, but I don't think it's going to affect the markets at all. I think that was mostly baked in by March. I think from day one of the war, when Europe finally got on board with sanctions, I think it was assumed that they were going to default on their bonds. I think Russia planned on using you know, their $600 billion to wait out sanctions for years until the West lost resolve. I think that they weren't expecting, you know, Switzerland of all places to actually break 500 years of neutrality and place sanctions on Russia. Um, I think that there's a reckoning coming when it comes to British banking and Russian oligarchs. And I think there's a reckoning coming here in the United States as well when it comes to Russian oligarch money here as well. And uh, no, I, I think that, that all that was baked into the market. They aren't really, Russia's economy wasn't really as internationalized as it was made out to be anyway. They're already uh, fairly insular. So if you listen to Ray Dalio, the economy is about to fall apart. Lots of mixed signals. So Ray Dalio is a brilliant man. And I actually love his interviews. I love his books. The problem with Ray Dalio is that Ray Dalio has, predict has been predicting that the sky is falling ever since I first heard of Ray Dalio back in the early 1990s. And the vast majority of his collapse predictions and the vast majority of his inflation predictions simply didn't come true. Um, so he, he, he's right in his, well, I think he's right. It's my opinion that as a, someone who's a student of economic history, that he is correct in a lot of ways when it comes to uh, debt leading to the collapse of economies. Uh, the problem is, is scale in this case. And the problem is where those other economies were placed in terms of the global economy, right? So you said there's enormous issue. There's a lot of criticism of Ray Dalio that you're probably not hearing depending on the type of media that you consume. I actually like to listen to him. I, I like to hear his interviews. I like to uh, see that perspective of, hey, maybe things aren't all hunky-dory. I'm kind of a natural economic optimist here because, uh, you know, the 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 uh, U.S. economy is basically like the Arturo Gotti uh, you know, if you guys know who Arturo Gotti was, he was a guy that was basically lose every second of every fight he was ever in and then turn it around with one giant punch. That's kind of like the U.S. economy. Uh, we keep getting beat up and keep bouncing back because of how innovative we are. Our economy keeps trading. And this is one of the criticism. This kind of goes a little bit into the politics. This is one of the criticisms I keep having with people that are, are, are diehard communists, right? Um, that philosophy and that book and all of the philosophy built on that was predicated on us on us existing in a semi-permanent industrial revolution economy, which never happened. As soon as the industrial revolution happened, other things started replacing it right away and the means of production started changing. And generationally in the United States, and not necessarily in Europe, but at least in the United States, 
generationally, it only takes like two or three generations before billionaires, their grandchildren are wearing shirt sleeves and you know working road construction for a living. It doesn't take that long for that to happen. So we have this constant sort of recycling of millionaires and billionaires. The idea that the upper class holds all the wealth and they keep it up forever just isn't true. You know, you look at the 1973, um, I think it was the, the Van, not the Vanderbilt, it was the, uh, it wasn't the Vanderbilt family reunion, but it was one of those other major industrialists from the late 1800s where those guys were like one of the, 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 the it was the Vanderbilts actually. Yeah. So by 1973, when they had like a Vanderbilt family reunion, there wasn't a single millionaire out of the 120 people that showed up. Right. And this guy was one of the largest, <laughs> one of the largest, uh, uh, somebody left a hilarious comment that I'm not going to highlight, even though I think it's very funny. It's not very PC. Um, and a lot of humor doesn't work when you're trying to be politically correct. Uh, but yeah, so the, the point of that was, is that we have this great recycling of wealth in this country. 80% of millionaires in the United States, and this is based on reams of research, even, even, you know, people like Dave Ramsey have come up to the same conclusion of this research, uh, which I'm not a big fan of Dave Ramsey, especially investment advice. 80% um, of millionaires in the United States are first generation millionaires. What does that tell you? It tells you that like, we're not, this is not a perfect country. This is not an economically fair country, but we do have more social mobility in terms of the ability to earn money than probably any other place on the planet. But that recycling of wealth is one of the things that makes us so uh, economically viable and makes us able to recover from disaster. And anyway, folks, uh, Hal says, great answers again. I wish you could bottle your historical knowledge. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in today. I'm trying to limit these to between an hour and an hour and a half so I don't burn myself out. And I will be back again tomorrow at one o'clock. I'll do about an hour. And we can talk more about you know historical precedent how it applies today, what you can do about this in the future. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. When it comes to individual stocks, there's a lot of stocks I have investigated, a lot I have not. So some of this stuff, I, I'm, I'm really doing it on the fly. Uh, but some of the other companies that we talk about, I can really go into depth on. Uh, but the future, guys, is really uncertain. It's not one that I'm not excited about. I am enormously positive. I'm not worried about the recession that we're in right now or that's coming. I'm actually really excited about what comes next because out of every crisis that we have you know, in, in the economy, something new and really exciting emerges. So anyway, I wanted to uh, say thank you guys for, for uh, tuning in and I will see you tomorrow.